Oh, okay. okay, look at that. Okay. And then you want to start the productive? I think I want to start Zoom first. Because okay. if I skip that, I'm I'm gonna miss that. <laughs> start Zoom up. Yeah. And then um So it's somehow not registering this thing. Okay, I think there's a step after I start Zoom. I click on Start Meeting. So that's just automatically mirroring my Zoom. Oh, and it's recording already. Let's stop the recording. So do we know of anyone who can't make it today? Do you guys know Nathan? Yeah, Laurel. Oh, she just wiped out from her editor duties. You have Ryan. Laura's here. Yeah. 
is here. Daniel is here. Ryan Smith is here. Yeah. Kira Tyler is here. Mel Wilson is here. Uh, we have a few people who are not cleared. You feeling okay? Daniel, Ryan, Kira, and Laura. You guys feeling okay? Yeah. Just want to make sure we care. You might want to click through things to see if that clears you. Okay. So it's a beautiful day. The world is in crisis. Uh, someone's paying three hundred thousand dollars for this education or for this schooling. And the schooling, even that schooling, is not going to get us where we need to be. Right? So what do you need uh, to get out of today's class? Let's list. What are your target questions? Well, it's early in the semester, and there's a few obvious ones. Like, uh, are you ever going to tell us how to do the sketch, right? So, so clear, again, this, like, right at the top, clarity on what's expected. Right? Who's with me? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. And while we're at it, I'm still not clear on the analysis. Like, like what, what are we doing with the sketch right? Are we doing it right? What are we doing with the analysis assignment? Are we doing it right? Okay. Who's with me? Yeah. What else? You a little pissed off now? You should be. What else do you need from your schooling in order to face the challenges in 2045? Remember, there's going to be a moment of truth. Every head of the room is going to turn to you because you're the one who went to Wentworth way back in the 2020s. So how are you supposed to be ready for that moment of truth? You don't get what you need to get out of today's class. What do you need to get out of today's class? Be ready for that new teacher. Remember, you're paying off your student loan still. You're trying to uh, make good on the promise of owning real estate. And, you know, if you want to have children, passing something on to them. Right? It's not easy in 2045. You're still paying off your It's not possible. We forget to uh, cancel student on that somewhere else. Probably. Okay. So you should be a little anxious and it should stimulate your a few target questions for today's class. You did this reading, right? So some of the target questions come out of the disappointment and frustrations of your assignment. Uh, some of your target questions, maybe more constructively, uh, come out of things uh, like, well, it could be a basic question like, why are we reading about my vote? Who cares? Or maybe, yeah. Why the word slump? Why the word slump? Excellent question. Why are we reading about informal settlements? Why do we care? We're going to, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move to another video. What, what does that have to do with me here? Who's with me? Yeah. Yeah. Why do architects need this? We're architects. We're not aid workers, right? What else? I kind of just go right off that and say the same about squatters. Why squatters? Yeah. What else? 
Like, how about something more like by the time we get to the end of the screen, I don't know, did you look at the end? Like, I, my group was doing the whole thing about Mumbai. I don't, I didn't even read the sketch writing. I didn't even read the reading. I'm, that wasn't my job. Who's with me? Or is it? So once, maybe we should look at it. Did you, did you guys look at the sketch writing? Did you look at the whole reading? Do you wonder where this whole thing, this, this whole book is going? Like where, how about that's a question? What's the point? Well, you did, you did that, right? You did the takeaway. Did you do the takeaway for just your segment? Or did you, okay. So let's do an additional thing. What's the point? This is a really useful question for the discipline of architecture. And I'm using the word discipline deliberately because this is the question that disciplines the discipline. Right? We have this noun version of, version of the word discipline, the discipline of architecture. And it's a profession of architecture, it's a noun. But it's also a verb. When you ask this question, it forces the profession of architecture to anchor itself back, it forces us architects to anchor ourselves back in what matters, right? What matters? What's the point? Why, why any of this, right? So what's the point of this reading? So let's, maybe we should add that to what we do. Um, are there any other target questions? This kind of covers a lot. I was hoping question come up uh, about the distinction between ownership and possession. Because that's the one that haunts me. Like I am still struggling to figure this out. Ownership versus possession. So let's just add that just to add some gravitas to this. Property ownership versus property possession. And part of me suspects, as you, you notice a theme throughout the course, in the 20th century, ownership was good. Possession is illegal. You just if you don't own the land, but you're possessing the land, all the cops. Right? And like many things that we encounter uh, moving from the 20th century to the 21st century, I suspect that that is backwards. I just the more I look at it, the more I suspect that ownership is illegal, is unethical, and possession is the way humans should occupy the planet. It would solve a lot of problems. And I think lingering over this whole thing, I'm just gonna, I think there's a one word answer to most of these things. Like this one, why do architects need this? But what's the point? Ownership versus possession. Why slum squatters? And why do we do this? I think, my one word answer, I'm just going to throw it out there because you know, woke up early and got dressed. I really appreciate that. You've got yourselves here. So I'm going to give you this. You, you deserve this. Gentrification. That's my one word. I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, I have, I'm not explaining it. I'm not following Missouri rules yet. But I suspect that it kind of boils down to that. That's why we care. Because if there is a challenge for any architect practicing in the United States, wait, am I recording this? Oh, push record. How do I get to record?
I'm recording. Okay. Because I was about to say, okay, it's a beautiful day. So uh, when we get into the profession, and let's say we're successful and we design this fantastic house and it's in Dorchester, or we designed this award-winning um, mixed-use complex, and it's in Madison. Uh, and it opens, and we won, we win the Harrison Parker Medal from the Boston Society of Architects, and we we'll create successes, and we get promoted, and we can pay off those student loans, and all of the success that, um, that flows from that. But then late at night, you, you're listening to the news and you hear about housing prices that are shooting through the roof beyond any capacity for normal humans in the Boston area to pay for housing. And you have this dark sense in the background, uh, in the pit of your stomach, that I wonder what what contribution I'm making as an architect to that inflation of housing. So it's, it's a haunting feeling and it should haunt us because there is a connection. We're gonna try to figure this out and try to help each other figure out what then must we do about it. What can be done? What can architects do? And I don't have an easy answer, but uh, I can, support the struggle um, to figure this out. So, um, so how did the sketch writing go? Was it okay? Did you get what you needed out of it? Um, what would you, like if, let's say we did it the exact same way. What if say, we were going to do it. What if, what if I told you we're going to do the exact same thing next week with a new life, with a new week? What would you say to me? What would you suggest that we do differently? How well would you describe? Well, how well did you do? I believe everybody did well. Yeah. Do you guys agree? Um, and how would you know if you did well? The teachers didn't give you a grade yet. So how do you know if you did well? Define well. Define well in the context of uh, throwing a lasso around that moment of truth in 2045 and pulling it right here to the room. So 2045 and 2022 are not so far away. Just compress that down. And here we are. We're doing a little bit of time compression. The big now of this moment that we're in is we just read this thing from Robert Neuwirth. Uh, we took a risk. We're, we're, we're gambling that there's something of value in here. We invested and have got a lot of time and effort to capture that value. And with the promise of carrying it forward to that moment too, and someone in the room says uh, you know, something. They say, oh, I know the answer. They ask a question. I say, oh, I know the answer to that. I knew the answer to this back in 2022, uh, the morning after doing that sketch assignment. What's the answer, right? You can go back to the website. There will still be an internet. I'm assuming. Let's assume there's still an internet. You still access to the sketch writing you did. The, the question of how how well sketch writing worked in guys won't be answered really until the test. When's the test? That's the test. So, do you think it's going to work? Should we look at it?
that, my search for Ignacio Cardona. Okay, so I should be searching for. So would you do it the same way? What would you change? Groups of three is, is the right size? Six pages, seven pages is the right chunk? One of the things I'm curious about, uh, were you able to forge continuity despite the fact that you were just dealing with these eight fragments? What do you think? Mm -hmm. what it is and uh, where we are and I know what way to describe it but like to be proud of where we are yeah you've earned the right to be proud I would say this is good um in 2045, you're going to quickly open the site after a search, and you're going to really appreciate um, these headings, benefits of squatter lifestyle, slow expansion, squat, like, thank you. Those headings are greatly appreciated. Um, the headings... Uh, the functional headings of um, outline and paraphrase, that's kind of useful while you're doing it. But, uh, but once you've collaborated successfully, I think those things can go away because we know that this is uh, questioning slash connecting slash speculating because it's in square brackets, right? And um, this highlight, why would that be highlighted? Okay. Well, let's take advantage of it. Um, what is that thing that's highlighted there? It's so close to being the bibliography. But the items of a bibliography uh, are separated from each other by periods. Well, look at that. Okay. So subtle change. Does that make sense? Did you guys uh, look at that video that said, was that clear? Everyone looked at that video? It's the same, isn't it? It's the same, right? Oh, look, here's a footnote. It's the same as the bibliography, right? Right, it's the same, right? No, it's not the same. It's different. So uh, let's do this. Did you guys use the suggesting tools?
So very close, but incorrect. This is the proper form for a note citation. This is the proper form for the bibliography, right? Why does it matter? Um, well, the, the question that most people ask, well, it's not really a question. The, the response that most people give is, because we're designers, right? Say, that's obviously not right. This must change. As a designer, I'm offended by the aesthetics of the system. It makes no logical sense. We must do it better than that. I'm on your side. I agree. Chicago manual style is stupid. Just I'm on the record for saying that. At the same time, it is a convention that has been embraced by the profession of architecture and the discipline of architecture. And uh, when we get out into the world, we either demonstrate, you know, we iron our shirts, we dress properly, we get haircuts, we show up on time, we do all the things as professionals that we that our social relationships expect of us. Uh, we drive a nice car, we have an iPhone, all of these things, the signals that we are competent professionals, we're part of the tribe of architects. This is part of that. You will either be respected or ridiculed or dismissed, depending on whether you demonstrate that you understand these conditions. It's like doing uh, construction documents. There are certain norms and standards that we just follow whether they're smart or, or whether we think we could design it better. This is just the norm and the standard. I wanna get everyone doing this automatically before you get to the graduate program. Okay, questions about this? The video, I think the video, what do you guys think of that video? It was pretty clear, like it's clear, Every time I try to teach these norms and standards, I'm like, I can't, this is so hard to teach. And then I saw the video and I thought, they do a much better job than I've ever done teaching these norms and standards. So I just send students to the video and we've been, do, we've been sending students to that video for 10 years or so. The library just sent me out of the blue an email yesterday saying, oh, we've canceled our subscription to that video and that service. And I'm like, Oh no, I'm gonna to have to teach it. So you're the last group that's, that's gonna have access to that video. I'm gonna to have to find a new video. So uh, we don't have to talk about this a lot, right? You guys are gonna get it. You guys are just gonna do it right? No? You are gonna do it right. Okay. Um, so um, the, the things, so my, um, my feedback on the sketch writing is this is great. Um, I think what we can do better next time is uh, maybe uh, what we're hoping will happen is the outcome will present us with kind of a very clear a diagram of the structure of ideas so that in in the midst of our meeting in 2045 we can just quickly scan just look over this thing and immediately access the thing we need to know like who was who was the the guy who uh, presented the idea that if you just give title deeds to the people in the informal settlements, it will release the, the what, what was his term, right? So let's look for that. Does anyone know? Who's the guy and what was the term? His idea uh, was to just give, go to the informal settlements and just hand out title deeds to whatever land people were possessing. What's that guy's name? Well, we don't really care what his name is so much as what's the idea, what and what was the word, what was the term he used? 
Can you find it in the sketch writing? All right, I'm in the middle of the meeting in 2045, and I'm going to go down. And it wasn't the part of the reading that I did. Um, it was one of my classmates. And um, so notice the, the use of the bold and the highlighting. The bold is one thing, that's key terms. The highlighting are key ideas that might be worthy of incorporating into the takeaway. So Riley McKenzie, McKenzie and Abriana are doing this outline. They're, they're doing some good outlining here. It doesn't need to be labeled. Um, Did anyone find it? No one's finding it. So look at what happens when I don't find the answer in the sketch writing. Oh, it's so sad. I pick up the book. Because back in 2022, what I, the goal was, was to engage the book bring it into my sketch writing and my understanding and into my package of resources, and then give the book away to the next person who I think might find it useful. I don't need the book anymore because uh, I did, I read it, I incorporated it into my sketch writing and I don't need the book because I have the sketch writing. The sketch writing substitutes for the book. So the thing I'm looking for is on page 300. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, I, I feel so much better. Phew. No one did this section. Did no one sign up for this section? Someone was signed up for it. Where, oh, they changed it in another document? Oh, that's clever. How does that make you feel? Yeah, but there's a hole. I mean, it turned out to be the one thing that did work. Okay. I actually feel much better that that's the reason. Because uh, <laughs> otherwise, we would suggest that sketch writing uh, failed to capture the value that uh, some of us find in this writing. But right at the end of this chapter, it gets into this issue of do you take the people who are possessing the land and put them across the ownership? And that's the solution. Which Back in the 90s, that was the city. That was like, woo, we all like hot champagne ports and like conferences and we cheered and said, that's it. The capitalism is going to save uh, the world um, by simply 
creating entrepreneurs out of every swatter and release the dead capital. That's the term, dead capital. No one owns it, so they can't borrow money against the value. It's capital, but it's dead capital because it doesn't result in any uh, financial mechanisms being used. Right? The reason a lot of us went to college is because our parents had live capital, they had their home, right? And they could take uh, a second mortgage, they could refinance their house, release some live capital out of the house they live in, they don't have to move out, they don't have to sell a house to go for that $300,000. Right? They can still live in the house, release the capital value of that house, which in the United States just keeps going up. It's a one-way ticket to the moon, plus the uh, Thus, the challenge, the struggle to afford housing yourselves, plus the cost of the dorms on campus, all of these things are connected. It's, it's a, a little ironic, and if you get into it, it's not ironic, it's the circular logic. The reason you're able to afford to go to college is because your parents are able to uh, you release the financial value of their homes and to a large extent, you generalize it. And, uh, and but that increased, that operation itself is part of the awkward pressure of housing prices that makes it more difficult once you graduate to rent and then purchase while you're paying off your student loans, no matter how high your salary, we're going to get into this in three weeks. We are going to calculate how much of a house you can afford to buy when you graduate. Uh, so we need to get four or five, six years. Uh, uh, where are you going to live? How much of a house can you afford? How much of your student loans? Where does that fit you? How long is it to move from the group? It's all of We're going to face this, and it's part of this second phase. Um, first of all, congratulations. Second of all, hooray. That's fantastic. It's not normal. So this is the part where we have empathy for the vast majority of young people struggling to not just get good grades, uh, but also to get into a good career and make a dream to justify all of that. I, I've had advisees show up in my office um, very memorably. Uh, one student said, one, I'm minoring in construction management. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out he was a senior and he's, uh, I'm trying to figure out whether to go to the graduate program in architecture or uh, should I go to work? And if I go to work, should I head more towards architecture or towards construction management? And my question was if uh, you don't mind me asking something this may seem personal, but before I give you advice. What's your student loan debt for you? And he got all quiet and he gave me a number that was uh, $200,000. And he said, Well, that simplifies your path. No, we're not going to go to graduate school. And no, we're not going to get a job in work. You should go to construction. Salaries are higher. They will appreciate you immediately and more. Uh, and you're applying up the ladder, you will be more certain to your very black students. So that's the more, actually, he's the other extreme. I don't need to unlock that level of student debt. It's a very real level of student debt. But most students fall somewhere in between. That is again part of the grounding of the reality of your school um, and part of the sharp focus in trying to uh, 
encourage you to take in this class that this stuff is not just educating this stuff. The reason we do this is because there's a lot at stake. So, um, so we've got a lot in there. Just going through the sketch there. Uh, uh, before we do the next step, I will take a, a serious look at this one and I will ask the guidance I have to do. Here's a question. Um, this really is back to a question. Is people No, six pages. I can get it. You can enter six or seven pages in the section, so you can talk to the library. That's another question. How much time do you spend on So not that, but we're going to do it again if we get back to the course. It's a lot of this The final stage is that now that we've done this, we two plus and three for everything. And because the really exciting thing is, believe it or not, uh, these two chapters are not the only And beyond this book, even before we go into this book, uh, there's that kind of sounds that's not the case. Before you go to the kind of sounds book, you have another book. And you have to do the same thing. That's how you do it. So you can do it. Instead of having six people, we have some thirty-one pages. That's what we would have done. So we can do that. So in the profession, what we do is we are comfortable. We trust our colleagues to bring it to take on the share of the work and bring it to the group and share us so that we all have comfort. If this were a project, that's what we would do. We would, uh, if we had 26 uh, people on our team, we would expand from 49 pages to 100 pages, and we would cover them all. We would bring it all together in a single document and share it so that we all, the whole team, benefit. It's more of a, a model of practice that I kind of like to 
Well, as in the profession, what could go wrong is one team could not do what they committed to do. But that's like in the profession of architecture. So I, I think that's, uh, I'm enthusiastic about that. So we have some topics to cover. Uh, and hopefully along the way. Oh, let me say some things. We got some analysis base. Um, again, it looks like we're all failing um, in your perspective. But again, you're not. Instead, I can't seem to be able to alter uh, the way Dark Space works. There are eventually going to be 24 points available. To but right now I've locked out uh, everything but 13 points. So you're getting eight points out of 10. It looks like it says eight out of 24, right? But it's not. It's eight out of, eight out of 13. And eight out of 13, what is that? <laughs> Well, 65%, why are we talking about percent? 61%, why are we talking about percent? Let's not talk about percent. Let's talk about Julia, four points in GPA. What is it? Just about two point something. It's two point something. He's got it. There's, there's like 17 computers and 18, 19, 20, 30, 2.46. 2.46. So, what is that? It's like a 2.5, which would make it a B plus. No, C plus. C plus. C plus. That's not an F, but it's not very good. I want to be better than that. So read the feedback. You should be a little pissed off, a little bit. Read the feedback. Uh, and if you don't understand the feedback, check the assignment, talk to a friend, talk to me, and make sure, because the goal here is to take that eight points, because last, <clears throat> Last one was out of 12 points. We're gonna we're heading into uh, into analysis boot camp week. The week from today. We're gonna have a session that's all about um, let's get the analysis down. It's really good at that. The first question is what oh interesting. I didn't do that. That is crazy. Let's, let's open your laptop and figure out why. Thank you, Susan. Um, yes. What, why is it switching? Yeah. Yeah. Why is it switched from 12 points to 13 points? Because uh, we have the four points associated with uh, the image and idea. Are you choosing uh, an appropriate image that helps us get to the issues that we're trying to get at? There are four points available for precision and impact. And they're they're very much related. That's why there's this symbol. This is really hard to get four out of four points. This is uh, to go from three points on the precision impact to get to four points. You kind of have to add an extra hour of work. This is where you're doing the hard work of pixel for pixel, painting the ground uh, and carving out every leaf on the tree. It's like crazy, tedious work, but it has an impact on the result. It has an uh, influence on how legible and how we are able to access the evidence that, upon which we base our interpretations. And then there's four points available 
for the relationship between the evidence and the argument. And the argument is, I'm not, I'm not really comfortable with the term argument, but that is the five, um, the logical sequence of five points, the logical sequence of points. Um, and so this is the Missouri rules part. Uh, are you translating directly from the visual evidence into uh, five points? Are you constructing those five points in a logical sequence that leads to a sixth statement that otherwise we would not be able to make? And that becomes the claim that moves to the beginning. Um, and so the four points here is just the relationship between the visual evidence and those five sentences. The next thing that I, uh, the next four points is called, it's a chain, uh, it's, a, it's a chain from argument to claim, to question, to caption. And by caption, I mean that first part of the caption where you're the most compressed part of the point. Emerging out of the evidence. So um, the only thing that I've opened up here is that one. And so the highest score you can get on this thing is one point. And if you wrote a claim, you've got that. Right? It's hard, as we saw last uh, Monday, it's really hard to do justice to the library parts with a uh, powerful in a claim. Hopefully someday you'll go visit and you'll be able to formulate something more effective. In the meantime, we continue to struggle to write a claim that matches the power of the architecture. But over here, in if, if what you care about is the grade, if you wrote a claim, you've got a point. If you went to the trouble to wrote to write to an attempt to capture those five sentences, you've got. So this is a grand total of 13 points that have become available since opening up the point. And in the next analysis assignment, we're going to open it up to a question. So this will go up to two, and this will go up to 14. And then uh, on the boot camp side, next Wednesday, we're going to try to expand. We're going to cover the caption. Uh, we're going to look at the citation. Uh, standards, and then we'll be able to open up a lot more points, and we'll quickly get up to the whole 24 points. Did you find your feedback? Yes. Well, I didn't. One other question. And then also, the grade doesn't match up. It wasn't a perfect grade. Well, this is the analysis, the 11 analysis. This is the 10 analysis. Yeah. How come it says view in line two? Uh, what happens when you click? Just highlights the. This is a malfunction. Okay, we'll look into that. Do you have a similar thing? No, I thought it was good to hear. Do you have feedback? Does everyone have comments in the grade? I have comments on the bit that we're just talking about. Okay. Um, How so? Uh, this was not graded based on two. Okay, we should look at that. So, if you have questions about, if you're not getting the feedback, let me know. There's something going wrong. Uh, if you have questions, like if it's contradicting the messages I'm giving here, then let me know. Uh, let me figure this out. Yes. Uh, I think the answer is last one. What if we do look at your comments? You're not able to fix it, or can we fix it? Well, later um, in the year. Or uh, I've been strongly encouraged uh, by both faculty and students to stop doing that because it makes the workload of the course it doubles. If you're going to do every assignment twice. Kind of doubles the workload for you and us, uh, especially my colleagues who are adjunct faculty, have begged me to stop doing that. Uh, 
Um, and uh, this is Groundhog Day uh, in the sense that we're doing this assignment 12 times this semester. It's not the kind of thing that you experience uh, in other courses where you get an assignment, you do it, and you get a totally different assignment to do that, and you get another totally different assignment to do that. No, this is a set of skills that we've identified as being at the core of what architects need to be able to do in the 21st century. We're going to, every one of you, it's like reading. You all know how to read, you know how quickly or slowly you've got rolling on that process. All of you will be experts at doing this. Uh, and this is uh, all about getting your fast. Yes. I understand that the previous two assignments, the additional eight or nine, are not inviting the opportunity for us to go through the material that we get resubmitted because it is the same result of the generation of this idea. But I'm, I'm just having a hard time wrapping my head around the idea that we do not get credit for any of the attempts at making it that final. Um, Everything that we do until that final analysis and more grades. Um, well, no, you could get a poor grade on the last one too. Exactly. That's yeah, that's available. That's an option. Yeah, yes. Yeah, or some of you are killing. You know, overall, this is the highest performing group we've ever seen. And part of that, it's a vindication, it's a, it's a confirmation that uh, throwing everyone in the deep end of the pool, saying, okay, uh, on the first assignment, you have to do the full caption, even though we're not going to teach you how to do the caption, we're just going to throw the instructions as an example at you, do it. And I'm, you know, and if you can fail at it, uh, get used to it. So we're not doing that this semester. It feels like we're throwing in the deep end, but we're actually compared with other years, we're pushing one component out at a time piecemeal to construct the whole 24 point assignment. Um, this is also an assumption about the grades. And the rubric of life systems. Mm -hmm. Was it linked? Nope. So weird. So, uh, one of the things about Brightspace is I don't think I have access to this view. I've never yeah. seen this before. I'm not even sure this is in Brightspace. This is Brightspace. And I think this is the actual grade, but this is the one that actually can be so, yeah. Okay, can you can we can be yeah we can talk about this we got yeah I used it once last year single word I I've never seen this. Yeah. What is your expectation? I'm just curious. Like what do you expect people to be at at eight? Is that why you didn't move? I'm just impressed. I I expect you all to be thirteen out of thirteen like this week. But uh, no, I understand that this is a hard assignment. If you get nine out of thirteen, it's like wow, that's pretty impressive. You are not thirteen, but it's that what you get. It's a minus. Pretty good. Okay. Um, so we'll sort through some of these feedback barriers uh, offline so we can get on these other things. Um, so here's some things that um, I, this is, shouldn't be a check. It's like, okay, we push this rock. Okay. We're not, we're not done with the analysis. We're going to actually spend a whole week suspending the content and just focusing on the methods and skill building 
uh, for success in the profession and the rest of this course. But now let's get to some of this content. Here's, here's the seven topics. And once again, there's some dark themes here, a lot of poverty and suffering. But uh, what we're looking for in the analysis this week, and one of the things I would add to the target is um, what am I going to analyze? Like if I were you, I'd want to finish the lecture class today with an image or with an idea of what image I'm going to analyze this week. Who's with me? Isn't that be cool? Because that could be really time consuming, just finding an image. Right? So it wouldn't be crazy to be looking at these images and uh, getting a sense of what would be useful uh, to use as an analysis image. So narrating my technical moves here, what I need to do is I need to share screen. No, I don't want to do that. Let me do this. I don't see the yellow outline. Okay, I guess that's two. Okay. So planetary urbanization, this gets to the big ideas that we've already covered. Um, when I first constructed this chart that we've seen before, uh, it was back in 2003 when I started teaching some version of this. Uh, and no one, you know, the data had just been released from the United Nations. Uh, you were two or three years old. Uh, and the United Nations data uh, projected that we were going to hit peak human which is a term I coined. Uh, we're going to hit peak human at 2060, around 9 billion people. But since then, things have shifted, not for the better. And, uh, and now we're, we expect to hit peak human around 2100 at 11 billion. That is the design standard. We are designing for peak human. When, when we design, we're designing for peak human. Um, and students always ask, well, why would it level off and start to decline? Well, this is why. This is the, um, the replacement rate. We hit the replacement rate, and then, um, and it really does boil down to girls and women's education in Africa. That's where, that's how this number moves. When girls and women have access to education, they get empowered to take control of their reproductive rights. And that's what, that's the only thing in human history. Uh, you know, China tried really hard for one child policy, really violent, desperate, oppressive attempt to control population. Uh, did it work? Uh, kind of, but the real game in town is uh, girls and women's education. And there are Wentworth graduates tackling girls and women's education in Africa. Um, uh, Jackie Ajiar is a thesis student. She hasn't completed, but whether she completes or not, she is going to Ghana. She's building a school. She will be pushing the needle on girls and women's education in Ghana. She's going to have an impact on this. Uh, that's what architects can do. Other than that, don't, don't think about global population. Think about uh, the nine thresholds. Remember the nine thresholds uh, of planetary um, fragility of the Anthropocene culture? 
the thing that matters is what is the per person impact, especially as people enjoy a greater success in life, they rise up the income ladder, uh, they move to cities, they become, they enter the consumer class. How can the hundreds of millions of people who enter the consumer class reap the rewards of the good life without uh, accelerating the, uh, the uh, reaching of those nine thresholds of carrying capacity to time? That's what we do in architecture. We reduce the impact of the good life. So it's the multiplier. It's the number of people times the per capita impact. And if it, I mean, right now we're only focusing, most people, most architects especially, are only focusing on the carbon footprint. What is the carbon impact per person experiencing the good life? And even in that, architects tend to ignore the big sources of carbon per person, which is food and transportation. And all we focus on is whether there's a solar, solar panel on the roof or not. That's important, but it's not enough. Uh, we have become an urban world. Uh, back around 2010, uh, global population, uh, which used to be mostly rural and a little bit rural uh, urban, has now become urban. And so we are an urban majority world. And here's the big one that brings us into the topic for today, is that um, the global population is 7 billion back here, and one of those 7 billion lived in uh, informal settlements. Right around the corner, when we had 10 billion, um, oh wait, this is one out of six. Okay, that's right. So one out of one billion out of the six total were uh, living in informal settlements. We're quickly approaching. Uh, there's a boom in there's a housing boom globally, and the boom is in the informal settlements. Most of the houses that are being built everywhere in the world are being self-built, and we're going to unpack what that means. Uh, and it's in the informal settlements of the world. And um, sometime around your peak career moment to, moments of truth, uh, it's gonna be closer to 4 billion. When we get to peak human, um, just working in round numbers, uh, it's gonna be something like four and a half billion people living in informal settlements out of 11. So this, if you're looking for uh, a place to expand your market uh, for our architectural services and formal settlements. So where do all these people come from? They are just, we used to split uh, the displacement of people off the land. Uh, we used to split it into natural disaster and human uh, made disaster. But then Syria happened, the civil war in Syria and Katrina happened, and all, all of these things, if you, if you just unpack it, Katrina seems like a natural disaster, right? Natural disaster, right? It's really natural disaster. It was man-made natural disaster. It was a natural disaster that had an impact because the Army Corps of Engineers uh, worked for about a century to dam the Mississippi River, to, uh, to artificially uh, isolate Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, the levees were created, but not properly enough to withstand uh, the force of Katrina. Uh, the insurance uh, industry was distorted by government policy to make it cheap and easy to build in the floodplain. That happens still. People build vacation houses on land that is disappearing uh, because the insurance companies are being subsidized by the US government so in a normal thing, uh, I would love to have a vacation house uh, on, the, on the coast, 
but the insurance is too expensive. They know that that land is gonna disappear in the next 20 years. So I can't afford the insurance, they won't cover me. Wait, the US government will subsidize that insurance. Thank you, US government. I can build a luxury house on the coastline. The land doesn't mean the land's not gonna disappear in 20 years, it is. And so every week you see video footage of a house falling off its stilts and floating up to sea. Um, I would show that, but uh, you probably have seen it. So man-made disasters uh, have a way of making natural disasters more serious, like in Katrina. Uh, similarly, the natural disasters of climate change causing drought is what has driven uh, the, the war in Syria. That was triggered by people starving because of the drought uh, and the government not doing enough, and so they rose up. What about Ukraine? Ukraine is one of the most fertile places in the world. It, you know, the reason why a big driver of inflation right now is the cost of food because of the food scarcity, because of the blocking of the flow of all of the agricultural wealth. Ukraine is not flowing uh, to the rest of the world. And so there's a food shortage. That's a lot of what's driving the inflation. Um, the number of displaced people uh, in the world keeps going up and up and up. And we've recently, by certain uh, estimations, we've recently surpassed uh, the 100 million mark. Um, and this, we talk about internally displaced people. Those are people who are pushed off, pushed out of their homes and off their lands within a country. And then we talk about refugees. And those are people pushed off their land and across national borders. And so increasingly, we include those groups together and we don't make the distinction anymore between natural disaster and uh, armed conflict because they're intertwined, increasingly intertwined. And uh, the distinction we need to make here is between pull forces and the push forces. When you are pulled into the city of Boston to pursue the dream of higher education, that is a good thing. When you are pushed off your land and flee, that tends to be a bad thing. So pull forces into the city, push forces into the city. One is good, one is bad. Pull forces, People are pulled into the city because they're pursuing opportunities that they couldn't have available elsewhere. Push forces, they're running for their lives. Uh, and so uh, it, the booming of urban populations is one thing, but it matters, uh, if, if it were up to me, I'd, I'd make two colors, um, maybe a purple that would blend red and blue that would show the degree to which uh, the, urban, the rising urban population is the result of push forces, bad, versus pull forces, good. Uh, and these statistics are subject to uh, verification. It's got a lot of problems. What's the population of Boston? So that is the population of the city of Boston, seven or 800,000. How did you know that? That's good. Mm -hmm. But what is, what is it, what, when you Google it, what does it say? Um, yeah. So it's interesting that when you Google it, it gives you the population of the municipality. But, uh, but there's, uh, but a lot of these are not the municipality of Tokyo. Uh, it's the Tokyo, it's the greater metropolitan area. And that is worth writing down. The greater metropolitan area is a technical term. Perhaps 
Yeah, so what's the number? It's a different number. It's four point what? Four point eight seven million. So what is the population of Boston? Is it seven hundred thousand or five million? It's a big difference. What's the difference between what we're talking about when we say seven hundred thousand and what we're talking about when we say five million? When we say five million, we're talking about the greater metropolitan area also called the Metropolitan Statistical Area, I think. Um, the Greater Metropolitan Area of Boston includes 101 towns and municipalities. One of those is the city of Boston. But it includes Billerica, it includes Everett, it includes a lot of the towns that you named last time we talked. Right? So, um, so Jakarta is here at 10 million. Don't believe it. That's Jakarta Metro, that's Jakarta, the, the municipality. The greater metropolitan area of Jakarta is 27 million. So I don't even want to look at this slide anymore. Let's, um, so uh, a big way that people end up in informal settlements is that they get pushed off their land driven to cities and where are they going to live they're going to go to a real estate broker and say we're interested in something near schools and shopping how are the schools in this neighborhood no they're fleeing for their lives they have the clothes on their back they're not even sure where their next meal is coming from they're forging communities with what's left of the people that they fled from the village and they're trying to survive and so they go to land that is unoccupied or, and deemed unbuildable, and they're occupying it. They're cooperating together, they're competing with each other, and they're just trying to get by to the next day. And uh, if we were gonna read more, there's some really interesting literature on uh, the idea of uh, camps, that a refugee camp or a squatter settlement is a special kind of space that has special conditions. And those conditions are the institutional arrangements. I'm so glad we talked about institution. We talked about institutional arrangements, right? I'm so glad I can now use that term. It's basically the social norms and structures and constructs within which we build, we occupy the land and build our own. And so the different conditions of the state of exception and the normal space uh, results uh, and generates different architectures. When we look at a piece of the world and we say, what's up with that? Which is what architects do. That's how we got to these issues. We say, what's up with that? And the answer uh, leads us to explore uh, these conditions so we so we can understand why Mission Maine looks the way it does and why uh, Alice Hayward Taylor looks so different. The explanation is in the institutional arrangements underlying the production of the architecture. So we, we covered this uh, history of architecture. We look at Roman camps that then become Roman cities. Uh, we don't look at this so much. Camps have, camps are architectures um, that are designed by architects. And um, let me, I'm gonna jump forward to the city of Beirut. Beirut, Lebanon is a city that has uh, received refugees from the surrounding regions. It's near Israel, it's near Syria, uh, it's near Jordan. It's a region of the world that has uh, routinely been uh, the site of armed conflict and uh, displacement of people within Lebanon and from neighboring countries. And um, I co-taught this course a few years ago with uh, a man who made, whose 
was from Beirut and made his graduate research about the mosaic of refugee camps and uh, how that mosaic, uh, the different moments that each piece of the city of Beirut was settled because of the way people were displaced from surrounding regions and pushed onto the site. And it's legible in the city. Um, we don't like these views uh, to get at the architectural issues you're trying to get at, but it's, in this case, we'll forgive it because it's pretty interesting to see. This is a, a housing typology, uh, pre-established, fancy, wealthy residents of Beirut. And this is something very different. One of these things is not like the other. What's up with that? It turns out that each of these neighborhoods started out as refugee camps and became parts of the city. When we design a refugee camp, we pretend that it's temporary. But 19 times out of 20, it's not temporary. It is the start of a new town, a new city. And several uh, thesis students have pursued this uh, in recent years, uh, designing refugee camps, uh, acknowledging the fact that these are proto-cities. They are going to evolve and change and can be the sites of continued investment by its residents, uh, understanding that they're going to be here the rest of their lives. Children are born in refugee camps and they die in refugee camps. Uh, and it's not right to call it a refugee camp after 70 years. It's a piece of the city. Um, so gentrification, so a lot of the, the hinge around which this pivots is the refugee camp is an extreme version of a housing crisis. And sometimes to figure things out, it's useful to look at the most extreme version of it. So if you're curious about how to address the housing crisis that the United States finds itself in the midst of, it's useful to look at the most extreme versions of the housing crisis in the United States. Uh, Boston it provides brilliant demonstration of the forces at work that generate the housing crisis. And then we look beyond that to other countries uh, and the forces that are both creating the housing crisis. And by the time we get to the analysis, the, you get to the analysis, hopefully some optimistic uh, interventions uh, at the architectural scale that hold some promise for, uh, for, for moving the needle on the housing crisis, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere. So um, when I was, uh, I think, a sophomore or junior in architecture school, I had a long path to get to architecture. I went to school uh, in engineering and in humanities. And once I arrived in architecture school, I had a very vivid experience in one share. I was walking in the library. I was walking down the aisle. And I was walking through this, this stacks uh, all about geography, human geography. It's like, oh, thank God. I used to have to take courses in this. Oh, I'm an architect. I don't need to know any of this. And in the corner of the room, next aisle, economics. I don't need to know about economics. I'm an architect. Down in the next aisle, history. I don't need history. I'm an architect. Right? All aisle after aisle, I was like celebrating the fact that my world had shrunk down and then I got to, and I know we have Dewey Decimal here, but most libraries are library economists. So I got to NA900. Oh, don't you love NA900? These big books with beautiful houses. I just love the NA900 section of the library. And I just opened book after book and said, ah, oh, architecture. I love architecture. Well, ironically, then when I graduated in, during uh, a recession, I had quite a successful run in some prominent architecture offices before the recession hit. And I escaped to San Francisco where the 
opportunities for even better than the recession reached there. And fortunately, I was able to get a grant uh, to do some research um, on a place I'd never been before, uh, the island of Java in Indonesia. It was a three month grant. So I went there and I started asking, what's up with that? What's up with this? Why does it look this way? Why do people live that way? And all of a sudden, the revenge of knowledge swept in in order to figure out the burning questions of architecture we sometimes have to pound in a stake in the ground in architecture tie it off rope in with our carabiners and go off into other realms tethered back to architecture to figure out what's going on in architecture and unless you do that you can't really figure out what's going on back in world of architecture. So that's my advice. Here we go. We're going to go into finance. Dubai. We've looked at Dubai, right? So we're going to do a quick tour of Dubai. Again, this time we're going to get at this word financialization. What is financialization? So uh, Dubai is on the coast, it's in a desert, and they build lots of tall buildings. Why, why do we build tall buildings? Why do we build tall buildings in Boston? Because it's the hub, right? The land is worth a lot. People, a lot of people walk to work in Boston, one of the highest uh, walking to work cities in the country, and the land is valuable. So it, the land is so valuable, it makes sense to go up because there's, you know, it's kind of crowded. Look at Longwood, right? It's very crowded, makes sense to, to build up. So historically, that's why we build up. So we look at the city of Dubai and we say, oh, it must be the same, right? No, it's the opposite. Dubai is a desert. Is there a shortage of land? No, there's an infinite supply of land. Uh, it was a tiny fishing village until about 1970. Why are they building skyscrapers? It turns out they're building skyscrapers in, as a vehicle for diversifying their investments. And I'm going to be simplifying things a bit. Um, but basically, uh, when an investor wants to uh, park their money, let's say you have $10 million, and I hope you do. Let's say you have $10 million. You want to put it all in the stock market? Yeah. If you have $10 million in the stock market, uh, I want you to leave the room, call your broker, and say, diversify my holdings. And he'll say, finally, I've been telling you you should diversify your holdings for years now. Uh, you should put uh, as much as you know, maybe 50, 60% in the stock market. Uh, because even though we've run into trouble lately, it's long term, it's your best, uh, best risk. And, but to hedge your bets, put some bonds. And the big thing you need to do is put some in real estate. And so if I have a chunk of money, if I'm a big investor and I have a chunk of money, I want to park it in real estate. I don't want to park it in real estate. I want to park it in real estate because it's got management costs. So I'm gonna park my investment in one building. So each uh, wealth fund, investment fund is building a building uh, and it needs to be as tall as the Hancock Park. These buildings are about the same height as the tallest buildings in Boston. Uh, who's, who owns it, who uses it, who rents it? And you could go to Dubai now and uh, get a job as an architect firm and the rents would be very low because no one really cares about the rents. This is a vehicle for parking investment. If someone rents it, no one rents it. I don't care. The main purpose of this architecture is to protect my real estate holdings. Now, what happens when you have a country's sovereign wealth fund, which is a huge uh, body of money that uh, usually in U.S. dollars uh, designed to stabilize the country's currency. 
Well, if you have a huge sovereign wealth fund and you're trying to diversify your holdings and you need to put some into real estate, you need a, if you have a big chunk of money, you need a bigger building. So they burged, they built the Burj Khalifa. Uh, they put an observation platform about here. And then uh, from this point upward, nobody, nobody occupies those floors. It's about the same height as the Hancock Tower above the observation deck. This huge piece of building, equivalent to the tallest buildings in Boston, are only there to hold up the top of the building to make sure it's the tallest building in the world. Now, the thing that uh, the useful takeaway from this part of the lecture is that there's use value and there's exchange value. The, the cost of a house, uh, cost of any piece of real estate is broken into two parts, the use value and the exchange value. We architects, we think we design for use value. That this is what we do. Uh, we participate in the construction industry because the outcomes are useful. These classrooms are useful. This is not an investment. This is all use all the time, pretty much. Uh, but then we look at one Dalton place. What's going on in one Dalton place? You know that third tower that was added to the Boston skyline? What's going on there? Uh, take a look and see if the lights are on uh, around six or seven at night when people should be home making dinner, getting ready to binge watch the Netflix shows. Uh, the lights are off. It's because uh, the purpose of the tops of a lot of these luxury buildings is as an investment. It's the exchange value. Some of you uh, grew up in houses in suburbia that have a use value component and an exchange value component. I grew up in a suburban community outside of New York City. We had uh, five kids and we hung out in the family room in the kitchen. But on the other side of the kitchen, that, that was all use value. On the other side of the kitchen, there was another room called the dining room that we only went in like twice a year, Thanksgiving and Christmas, right? What's that? How is that justified? It's like, and then beyond the dining room, there's a living room, so-called, but we don't live in there. We have Christmas in there and piano lessons, but and then this foyer with this other staircase, no one uses that staircase, no one uses the living room, no one uses the dining room. What is all that? My mother cited the story that the real estate broker She's a very, she was a very practical woman. Uh, she said, why do we need all this? And he said, oh, don't worry. It will help the resale value of your house. Right? That's the exchange value uh, part of the real estate equation. And we need to remember this formulation as we move forward because it's going to come back around in future weeks. It has to do with how we can afford to send our children to college is the refinancing of the house. Thank you, exchange value. Um, it worked. Um, but what are the downsides? Every time uh, one of these uh, high-end investment properties uh, is sold, the buyer wants it to be the highest possible price because that way they can park more money. And they don't care if they rent it out. They don't care if anyone lives in it. They just want to uh, be able to count on 10 or 20 years from now, selling it again for as much or more money. The United States is a very strong real estate market. That's why you have so many absentee owners. Uh, a member of the city council in Cambridge asked me to help figure this out. And I told some stories about, uh, I was helping a dance studio trying to find a new uh, location. Uh, and I was gonna help them acquire the real estate and design a uh, studio. There was this derelict gas station that was just sitting empty unused. And so we looked into figuring out who the owner was. Turns out he was from overseas. Uh, we said, are you interested in selling it? And basically his answer is, no, I'm not interested in selling because then I just have to buy another piece of real estate on Mass Ave in Cambridge because I need to park my money somewhere. 
He did not care that no one was using this property. That's not why he bought it. And so there was a dead, so there are dead zones throughout cities, especially expensive cities. There are dead zones in our skyscrapers uh, because of the exchange value prevents it from being used. And every time real estate goes unused, uh, it increases, uh, it constrains the supply. It increases the cost of even the uh, cockroach infested apartments of Brighton. Um, they're so expensive. They're not, you know, they're not wonderful, but they're really expensive. Dalton Place is part of the reason why it's so expensive to live in Brighton. And we need to be able to tell the story that this real estate is important and that it is going to hold its value. And so we employ star architects and we plant explosives up and down the towers and we perform this ritual renewal of how important this real estate is. We celebrate it on the covers of uh, design magazines. This building is important. In other words, it's going to hold its exchange value for a long time. And this uh, ritual renewal of the spectacle of the Burj Khalifa and the celebration of the star architecture production is part of the constant maintenance of exchange value. So what does that have to do with housing? Um, well, I, I said, uh, and this is a little bit of urban economics, that uh, every city has a 100% location and that may be downtown crossing. And if that's the center of Boston, uh, you would expect that to have the highest real estate value in the Boston region. And then the further you get away from the center of downtown crossing, the lower the value of the land, and the lower the rents, and the lower the housing costs. So what happens when you lift this up, when the 100% goes up, the rate changes as well. So the cost of an apartment in Billerica or Everett goes up every time uh, someone sells a luxury apartment in Dalton Plaza. Does that make sense? So um, back in the post-war period, when we had a temporary moment of believing that the government could actually do something about housing, the government got in the business of building housing. And it was a very bright, optimistic moment that uh, turned ugly really quickly. Um, for reasons that will be covered here. These developments are run by the St. Louis Housing Authority. This is a far cry from the crowded, collapsing tenements that many of these people have known. Here in bright new buildings with spacious grounds, they can live. It was a very beautiful place, like a big a hotel resort, I'd say. It was like uh, an oasis in the desert. All this newness. Modernism I never thought I would good. live in Modernism that kind of a surrounding. What happened? Well, one day we woke up and it was all gone. <laughs> Pulled up with the moving van. I knew at that point that it was hell on earth. Crew and Hydro looks like a battleground. Vandalism and neglect have left fear among the remaining occupants. In the middle of 50s, St. Louis thought it had solved its low cost housing uh, needs. But instead, a monster was created. The experiment had gone terribly awry. It was just uncontrollable. Demolition. And that was the moment declared uh, by Charles Jenks as the end of modernism and the start of postmodernism. I think we've looked at that. And he pinpointed it to the second that the demolition happened. In 1972, 3.32 p.m. Yes. What was that? Um, St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Do you have the name? I think the library owns it. It's called the Pruitt-Igoe. 
And we're going to circle back around to a lot of these themes, including that one. Um, so uh, one of the useful things that you will be bringing to your team in 2045 is you will have a solid working understanding of what is an informal subject. And here it is. Here is the solid working understanding that you will bring. It was established at this moment, uh, I think it was 2002. To, to qualify as an informal settlement, a settlement, a neighborhood needs to fall short on three of these five conditions. The first condition is a settlement uh, that uh, a, a proper settlement has secure land rights uh, without a significant risk of displacement. And so in the context of uh, Newark and DeSoto uh, in the United States, either you have a title deed or you don't have a title. Either you own the property, either you own the land, it's a fee simple, a single family house, which is uh, the norm established in the post war period, or this new thing we call condominium, where you have collective rights to the land and the common areas, but you have fee simple ownership. Fee simple is uh, a US term, legal term. Fee simple means I pay the fee, I simply own it. It's not complicated. Fee simple. It's, I don't share the rights with anybody. Within the walls, within the sheetrock of condominium, I own it. Within, uh, if it's a single family home uh, across this boundary line, I own it. It's very difficult for a town to take possession of the property because of the strength of the institution of fee simple ownership in the United States. In other countries, in the United States, we have fee simple ownership and we have rental and we have condominium in between. Three categories, we're done. That's it. Everywhere else in the world, there are uh, varying degrees of property rights, including use rights. I own the building, but I don't own the land. I don't own the building, but I have I've paid money to use the building. I've paid money to use the land. 30 different levels is quite common of uh, different property rights. Um, so number one is secure land rights. If I have secure land rights, then as we saw in the new word, uh, I will take what little money I have and some sweat equity and I will improve my home. If I, don't, if I could be evicted, if I could be thrown off the land any week now, I'm not, I'm not gonna invest in the housing. And so that's often the biggest single factor in determining the outcomes of informal settlements. The second one is adequate access to safe water. 20 liters per day per person. How many is that in America? It's about five gallons. <clears throat> 20 liters of water per person, and the water comes from less a half hour or less uh, from home. A significant portion of humanity carries the water every day. The job of carrying them the water every day falls to girls and women who should be in school uh, getting educated and having an impact on reproductive rights and population growth. But the, this human resource of the girls and women of a lot, big part of the world is devoted to simply collecting the water every day. And related to clean water, sanitation that keeps the uh, septic systems flowing in a way that doesn't conflict with the wa clean water supply. Uh, one of the core technical principles of all planning and design is don't shit where you eat. Sorry, that's so technical. Um, but uh, that's a fundamental principle that uh, you should keep in mind. Fourth, 
is the adequate space. Five square meters per person. That doesn't mean I have a room that's five square meters. It means my share, where my bed is, and the bathroom, and the kitchen, and the hallway, and the circulation. My share of that, if there's five of us living someplace, uh, there should be 25 meters for that household. Um, how big is five square meters? How, is, how, how much? No. It's about 50 square feet. So how big is 50 square feet, five square meters? It's not a lot, but that's the, uh, the standard established. Now, now that we've done all this work to identify what are the, what's the definition of informal settlements, ah, we're always doing this. We, we lay something out in hard and fast rules, and then we complicate it. Ignacio says, um, sure, there is a very clear distinction between formal economies and informal economies. And participants in formal economies tend to have consumer, they tend to have discretionary spending uh, opportunities. Participants in informal economic activities tend to not have discretion, they're just getting by, they're barely sufficient. And so that label of formal economy, informal economy, has been very sloppily uh, applied to architecture. And this brilliant man has pointed out, yeah, not really. Don't call it informal settlements, please. Um, looking at Caracas, he's pointed out that a heck of a lot of what goes into a so-called informal settlement is a lot of formal stuff. Actually, when I built my house for my family on land that I don't have secure land rights to, uh, when I finally got enough money together, I actually hired a professional builder who knew how to size and lay steel reinforcing bars in my concrete column, concrete slab, concrete roof. See my rebars sticking out? That's in case I want to sell off my roof rights and uh, allow someone to build on my roof. Can you do that in your parents' wood frame house? No, you can't do that. It's a shack compared to the sturdiness of these slums. This can go up five, six, seven stories, no problem if you can arrange the vertical circulation. Um, so there's a heck of a lot of formality, concrete blocks, the materials, a lot of this, uh, you really, and what I've suggested to Ignacio is maybe what we should do is call uh, uh, this stuff settlements because this is what most of humans have done throughout human history and still do, and increasingly a majority of humans are being housed in these settlements, we should call what we do in the United States formal settlements. And everything else should just be called settlements. Yes. Before you kind of keep going forward, I have a question about like settlements. So you said that you actually like you didn't build the home, but you designed it and had it built. By somebody mm -hmm. was that like how expensive was that like in a range of what well it? it's not really designed we know there's no architect per se it's just builder we need a room we know what rooms are we know the spanning capacity it's a three by four uh, meter uh, room and so there's your columns are here and go up and then we infill the walls with brick and we don't bother putting anything on the outside because uh, we don't need that. So um, we hire one guy and then we mobilize the family and our neighbors and our extended family and we all pitch in labor. So it's self-built. 
but at the guidance of a formal trained architect. So, um, we're out of time. If you look at the slideshow, especially starting here, you will see some hints at some positive things that architects have done in Caracas, in Kibera. Uh, you might want to look at the work of Mass Design Group. Mass Design Group uh, is a local firm. They tend to hang out at Wentworth. They tend to hire from Wentworth. They are really the model of what can be done as architects uh, to push the needle on these issues. And then we look at some of the work uh, in the Caracas studios uh, of our students, including this project that keeps showing up on all my slides. This was a, one of the students uh, from the sophomore studio in the Caracas uh, Library Park like uh, challenge to the students. Uh, and this is what Cheryl came up with in 2009. Um, so let's just park it there. I'm going to record the, um, the 10 o'clock version as well. So if you want to circle back and see a slightly different uh, take on uh, the content of today's lecture, uh, you'll see a slightly different version. And so let's try to troubleshoot some things here. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.